Welcome. Government is facing a data crisis. If you are not already addressing it, you may be feeling the symptoms as a leader or upcoming leader in government being asked to improve service delivery, modernize, and at the same time manage cost containment. And it happened seemingly overnight. Data used to be boring and predictable. Suddenly, your data is in demand and more data is being thrust upon you. This explosion of data from different sources is in different shapes, tables, documents, email, social media, the internet of things, or video. And you're being asked to do different things with it for users you didn't even know you had. All the while, you are charged with keeping your data secure and managing the demands of changing policy, regulation, and legislation. Today's esteemed panelists will give you a glimpse into their organizations, perspectives, and challenges from three different perspectives. Caltrans certainly has the three Vs of data, volume, veracity, and variety. Ms. Tracy Geisler, rising IT leader and division chief at Caltrans, will share the insider's perspective. As receiver for California Correctional Healthcare Services and associate dean for strategic, strategic initiatives and professor at UOP McGeorge School of Law, also known as Mr. Fixit, Mr. J. Clark Kelso is uniquely suited to share his perspective on data governance issues, in particular around the complexity of PHI and PII data while responding to legislative inquiries and public demands. And Ms. Sarah Mazur, MarkLogic Enterprise Architect and Principal Consultant, as the engineer on this panel, will pull these challenges together with a case study of a government organization with similar challenges and how they rose to meet them. Our hope for you today is that you are inspired by these esteemed panelists and that you can take away three nuggets that are valuable to you as you are on your journey as leaders in government. I'm Cheryl Miles, your host and moderator for this session. So let us begin. Caltrans touches every one of our lives every single day. Whether on your commute or on your road trip vacation to one of the lovely destinations in California, we're all lucky to be recipients of our world-class transportation system. With more than 50,000 lane miles, 12,000 highway bridges, permitting 400 public use airports, and operating three of the top five Amtrak intercity rail services, California's famous diversity includes diversity of landscape, which offers special challenges to Caltrans. Adding to this diversity, Caltrans plays a strong role in the governor's greenhouse gas reduction, has a $52 billion maintenance effort underway from SB1, and a responsibility to taxpayers to measure performance in one of the most progressive states in the nation. These factors are but a few that offer a special challenge to the IT organizations that support them. We are pleased to hear today from Tracy Geisler, IT branch chief, rising leader, three, with three years at Caltrans and previously 20 years at CalSTRS. Tracy knows something about change. Tracy. Thank you, Cheryl. Thank you, Cheryl, and good morning, everyone. As Caltrans embarks on the most ambitious repair program in more than a dec in decades, it does so armed with an unprecedented amount of data about California's 50,000 lane miles of highway. The sheer volume of information is mind-boggling. 
Caltrans gathered more than more raw data in a single system-wide laser scan survey than the Hubble Space Telescope sent home during its first 20 years in space. To say that the department gathers an astronomical scale of data is no exaggeration. The vehicle-mounted scanners generate about 25 gigabytes of data each mile that they survey. Scanning about 15,000 miles, centerline miles, takes up about 375 terabytes of data. The Hubble, in comparison, collected about 45 terabytes in 20 years. The Caltrans also utilizes another system that uses lasers to take three-dimensional measurements of structures on the state highway system. Un unlike simple text data that takes up very little storage, these 3D images generate generated by the system can produce petabytes of data. Now you all know that a petabyte is approximately is one quadrillion bytes, which is in comparison more than four times the amount of data that is in the US Library of Congress. And that's just the tip of the digital treasure trove at Caltrans. Other types of data at Caltrans are the normal stuff like financial and personnel data, but we also have traffic data, pavement health, bridge data, not only around bridge specs, but all of our designs, everything around our state highway system. We also have stuff around, we have GPS data, we have um, shake uh, earthquake data, which if you go to our booth out in the um, center, you'll see you can get a demo, demo of QuakeCast. Um, but the, those are just some of the few items, few types of data that Caltrans has. With the vast amount of data, you can imagine the complexity of all of our systems. Most people don't recognize that we have sensors in our highways. Traffic Ops uses the data from these sensors to determine speed, count of occupancy in vehicles, going over the traffic, going over these sensors. With these three pieces of data and some assumptions like the average length of a car, um, following distance based on speed and a few others, we can now tell if a car is towing a trailer, if a truck is towing one or two trailers, the percentage of trucks versus cars on any segment of highway, the average speed of that segment of highway, and how many cars there are on each segment during, e during the 24 hours in a day. So what else do we use this data for? Caltrans reports on congestion of our state highway system. I'm sure we've all encountered a little bit of congestion on your daily commute. Division of Planning, working with local regional transportation planning agencies or metropolitan planning agencies, identify roadway projects to improve um, our roadways to um, reduce con congestion on our highways. Traffic management centers use this information along with the cameras that we have out on the highways to look to at and confirm incidents out on our highways as well as reported debris. Maintenance and construction uses the data to determine when, during the day or night, it's best to do a small project, and also how, during when we're doing large projects, how to reconfigure the lanes so that we can still have um, the maximum amount of traffic going through any area that is a construction zone. Caltrans safety inspectors use the data, along with other data, to determine whether or not there are ways that we can make our roadways safer. Caltrans also shares this data with public entities so that those entities can use that information and create social media, uh, use that data to create social media applications such as some of our, um, uh, like we have quick maps for Caltrans, but you also use Google Maps or you know I, iPhone map, whatever it is. So we share the data so that it is available to the public. So these examples above show how Caltrans leverages the data from our roadway sensors. Imagine what we can do with that data as, as well as additional data from other sources. Part of the future is our integrated corridor management system, which takes the state highway data and adds local roadway data to determine how we can work together to move traffic through a major incident on one of our highways. This allows this allows the coordination of alternate routes on surface streets with coordinated signal lights and routing signs along the local streets. This puts you on a selected streets that will expedite your travel around the incident on the highway and back onto the highway at, um, as quickly as possible. Historically, Caltrans data, similar to many other departments, sorry, 
um, has siloed data based on our bit lines of business. This is an ever increasing, there is an ever increasing need to break down these silos of data and share business, data across business lines. Given the ever increasing demand, not only by control agencies and legislature, but also by business partners, counties, cities, and local entities, for information around Caltrans and its operations, Caltrans has embarked on an effort to develop a BI strategy and roadmap. With this, we are working to further break down those silos and to be, provide a foundation for organizational-wide data governance. Leaders need to be able to trust the data. Trust that the data is a true representation of what was, what is, and what might be. They need to be able to leverage that data to make sound business decisions to be able to look at what has been done and use it as a benchmark, to leverage their data, to measure progress, and to plan for the future. So do we know what's coming next? Not always. So how do we prepare for the unknown? I have a few common sense tips. Be curious, take small steps, be flexible, don't seek absolute perfection, move towards the challenge, keep your goals and objectives in focus, in other words, don't lose sight of what is most important. And lastly, leaders who embrace the unknown have a great capacity for facing challenges. You can't always control what happens to you, but you can control how you react. More importantly, you can prepare for the unknown, and don't forget to lean into it. Thank you, Tracy. I think uh, the exciting thing that I hear about Caltrans is that they use data not just for planning for future roadways, but they're using real-time data to help with uh, traffic, and I think there's a big future in that. That's very exciting. Um, thank you, and I apologize, I didn't advance the slides, but here we are. Um, our next panelist, uh, we'll have time for questions and answers at, after all three panelists have spoken. So um, our next panelist, we're very honored to have Mr. J. Clark Kelso, the Associate Dean for Strategic Initiatives and Professor of Law at UOP McGeorge School of Law. In 2008, Professor Kelso was appointed by the Federal District Judge Felton E. Henderson as the federal receiver for California's prison medical care system, charged with making changes in that system to bring it into conformity with constitutional minimums. So receiver J. Clark Kelso and his team are improving the quality of and access to healthcare for California's 125,000 adult inmates in 34 state prisons. Mr. Kelso is one of the leading public administrators in the state. Remember I said he was Mr. Fixit? for California state government it's because he's held a number of high-level positions in California's executive branch, including service as California's insurance commissioner, director of the Department of Information Technology, director of the California Performance Review, director of the Department of General Services, chair of the California Earthquake Authority, and for six years as the state's chief information officer. We're very pleased he, he's received many awards and accomplished, has so many accomplishments that I told him I can't do them all here because we don't have enough time. So I know that you can, you can read about them at your leisure if you have a, a, a spare time for that. Um, so I'm very pleased to introduce Mr. Clark Kelso, and he will talk about what did you know and when did you know it. Okay, those are my five bullet points. I have five minutes. Um, so uh, we better get started here. My, on my stopwatch, I've already taken 15 seconds. Um, what did you know? When did you know it? Uh, you know, those are kind of like Watergate type questions, right? Um, and the first bullet point uh, speaks to that. Responding to legislative inquiries and auditors. Now, whenever I see, um, you know, legislature or legislative committee or legislative inquiries, and certainly whenever I see the word auditor, uh, what comes to mind uh, to me is public accountability. Accountability for something that you're responsible for. And the interesting thing about the data challenge that uh, I think we are all facing, um, a lot more data, 
in, in a sense, it's good and it's bad. Uh, it's good, I think, in terms of public accountability because, by gosh, there actually is a lot of more information available now uh, that can explain what it is you're doing, whether you're doing things correctly or poorly, uh, if you analyze the data, how you can improve. Uh, that's all great um, because certainly in terms of the work I'm doing now, uh, I'm able to manage much better because I now have data that's really up to the day in terms of medical treatment of all of our 135,000 patients. When I began the job 10 years ago, there were no data systems at all, um, no electronic medical records. Just finding out what was going on within the system uh, was a months long effort. Um, you know, a little bit the same thing, like, you know, I, I would ask in terms of budgets even, uh, you know, I would ask my budget officer, okay, you know, uh, are we going to be able to stay within budget? And you ask that question kind of repeatedly throughout the budget year. Well, you know, it used to be they would say things like, well, I'll have to get back to you on that, and, you know, it'll take us a couple of months to figure out whether we're actually going to be able to stay within budget. Why? Well, because they didn't have any uh, automated data systems tracking expenditures, uh, linking it to budgets. Uh, we didn't have good patient information. Now we do. Um, and the good thing then is that you actually can manage, and when the legislature comes over and the auditor comes over, and they're going to hold you accountable. Um, that's the bad side also of accountability. They can hold you accountable. So now that you have all that data, you had better pay attention to it. And you'd better manage based on it. Because if you don't, the legislature and an auditor is going to come over and they're going to point to your own data and say, wait a minute, you should have known this. There were red flags everywhere. What were you doing? Well, if you're not watching your own data uh, and managing to it, you're going to get yourself in trouble. So that's my first big bullet point on legislative inquiries and auditors, the good and the bad. Accountability is great. Management is great. But if you got all that data, you'd better pay attention to it. Security considerations. All right, my overriding um, thought whenever I see uh, PHI, personal health information, or personal identifying information, or, oh my god, encryption, uh, auditing, redaction, and then governance. My, my general reaction to security is, uh, oh, that's my last nightmare. Uh, security has become uh, nightmarish. Um, when, you know, when I was CIO, maybe now 13 years ago, um, we had our first laptop that was stolen that had personally identifiable information. And this was shortly after uh, Bowen's legislation that said, now you have to report publicly and contact everybody. All right, uh, you know, 13 years later, we made a lot of progress. Uh, everything is supposed to be encrypted. Uh, is it always properly encrypted? It still isn't always properly encrypted. Uh, in the last year, we had a contractor uh, who finished up their work. Uh, they had a laptop. They didn't properly uh, clean it. Uh, it was lost. So we had to consider that to be, oh my God, uh, there's a security breach. We had all sorts of information on it. Uh, as a result, uh, I'm now the defendant in, oh, about a, you know, 1,200 lawsuits. Uh, asserting that, my God, I didn't take proper care of all of that data. Um, and it's an important thing to do. You have to worry about it. Um, you know, encryption, uh, my goodness, I just had a conversation yesterday with somebody who is an outside entity that we have to report to. Um, they're complaining that we're sending them encrypted emails now. And, you know, I know what had happened. My IT people suddenly realized, wait a minute, we're, we're putting out over uh, a clean email a network information that is confidential. So, you know, we need to be encrypting it. Well, okay, now I have to deal with that problem, that uh, someone who I have to report to, we have to figure out how do we send you encrypted information regularly uh, when that person is not very technologically sophisticated. How do I protect my information when I've got 
uh, non-technologically sophisticated people involved. Uh, security also is the problem of how many people have access to the data. And that's the problem we're seeing with the United States government right now in security data. Apparently, huge numbers of people have access to top secret information. Well, that's a risk. I've got the same problem just in my systems. Uh, I've got 9,000 employees, something like 16,000 pieces of equipment. Uh, all of it has confidential information on it. How do I make sure that only the right people get access to the right information? Should I be tracking the information uh, in a way where I can, with an audit trail, determine who may have disclosed something? Uh, I've got cases right now internally where it appears that one person got access to information they shouldn't have had related to a disciplinary action against another person. Is there a way I can solve that problem? I mean, every day we're dealing with these sorts of very concrete, very specific security problems on how do we make sure our data remains secure. Um, it's a never-ending, at this point, I think, never-ending process. Uh, how do you keep up with new data, the volume of data, the number of people who need to use it, and at the same time maintain confidentiality of the data as necessary? So I have nightmares. <laughs> so I think uh, your takeaway from that is you are not alone. If Mr. <laughs> Kelso has nightmares. You know, we, we have to continue to work on these issues every single day. Thank you so much. Um, and lastly, thank you so much. And he's going to get a chance again. Each panelist will, at the end of the session, give you their one nugget takeaway. So, you know, I said I wanted you to have three nuggets. Well, we're going to give them to you for free at the end of the session. So. <laughs>